Here in 1 Corinthians, I'm going to begin in chapter 4. i got one verse, and then we'll go back to 3. Father, thank you tonight as we move from this part of the service into the Word of God. I pray that in this final service, you gave us the theme, and then shall the end come. May this message be a stirring word that would sink deep into our hearts. God, we don't want to leave here tonight from this camp meeting to go into all the world to reach that harvest without, first of all, every person in this house tonight knows you as Savior and Lord. I pray that you would deal and talk to every heart tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let a man so account, chapter 4, verse 1. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Chapter 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able. For you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul. And another, I am of Apollos. Are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything. Neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now, he that planteth, he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try or test every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. He himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Stop right there. And then shall the end come. Uh, Brother Schutz last night, I, uh, on, sitting on the front row, talking about the latter or the end. And then he started talking about some of my other verses. Wood, hay, stubble. I'm on the front. I said, God, get him out of that book. Don't let him preach my message. I won't have nothing to say tomorrow night. 
But anyway, I, I knew it was such a connection. It was a divine connection of what I believe God wanted us to climax this service, this camp meeting with. The end, church, to me is always as important as the beginning. Although the beginning is extremely important. I don't think it's worth anything if we don't finish. Jesus said, count the cost before you start the construction. Unfinished projects only tell us the builder ran out of money or lost heart. We must know that tonight. Brother Clinton, if he taught us one thing, taught us a thousand. But one thing he kept reminding us, the end is always contained in the beginning. God never starts till he's finished. So when God sees you and I, he sees Christ. And then all of God's work, all of God's dealing is to remove from us what's not Christ. So that ought to give you a comfort tonight. You know, so many times when the Holy Ghost deals and brings conviction, we feel like, my, I'm not even saved. Every time they preach, it's like i got to run to an altar. Or every time they preach, I feel like I'm not saved. Let me tell you tonight, when your heart's pure towards God, your motives are pure towards God, you repented of all known sin. There's not any willful sin. When the Holy Ghost comes forth and begins to convict that heart, you, all you need to know is that he loves me. And because he loves me, he's only revealing, only removing what's not Christ. If, he, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with the brethren. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. What? As we walk in that light. So you may be convicted tonight. That doesn't mean you're lost. That just means God is saying, I'm moving you out of what you are, conforming you more and more like Christ. So when he sees us, he sees his son. In all his work, all his dealing, he never starts till he's finished. You must know that. God makes his own ministers. Then the church recognizes them. Then sets them apart. But man cannot make a preacher any more than they can make a convert. 1 Corinthians 4, 1, I read it. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ that literally the word could be translated sub-ministers of Christ. We are under shepherds. He is the great shepherd. We are uh, sub-ministers of Christ. There is a sense then of humility about it that shows every one of us tonight that the very spirit of Paul himself was a humble man. The name Paul was taken by Saul of Tarsus. Why? Because it literally means the little. He took that name on. Saul of Tarsus converted on the road to Damascus. Then we all know the great story. But Paul, Saul of Tarsus took that name Paul because it means the little. And his humility always revealed his name. We've heard it said a hundred times in this pulpit. Name in the Bible denotes character. When you said Jacob... You knew you were a trickster, a shyster, a con, a manipulator. Name in the Bible. So when you said Paul, not Saul anymore, but Paul, he looked at you, I'm the little man in Christ. I'm the little one. I'm the humble one. He always took the lowest place in Christian ministry, even as his blessed Savior, who also took on the spirit of a servant, 
and said to his own disciples, The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Church, we must realize that we must be humble men and women. Count it a privilege if he uses you to win a soul. Count it a privilege if he allows you a cash flow that you can support a ministry or a mission or a missionary. Count it a privilege. Humble yourself before God Almighty. Jesus said, Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. The spirit of pride is bad enough in a so-called Christian. But my God, tonight, it is far worse in a so-called minister. Oh, God. Sometimes it takes us 15 minutes to introduce somebody to our pulpits. Trying to tell all the accomplishments, everything they've accomplished, all the degrees, all the things they've done and accomplished. Paul said we're nothing. The very apostasy of that early church, it came about through the competing voices of the rival bishops, patriarchs, and popes. The very thing, church, that's robbing the church in this hour of true Pentecostal power is our exalting of men or of men exalting themselves to the very dishonor of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you I said at the breakfast table God said a proud look I hate how many preachers on television are so proud of themselves they strut like a banny rooster God said I hate it Somebody told me about a certain preacher that failed doing this or that or whatever. And they said, he's been so humbled. And I, I, I hope that whatever it is the person's going through, I said, if they had went out like they came back, they would have done just fine. How many of them strut out? And I'm going to show everybody what they can do. Shaking hands one night after church, a man said to me, I'm leaving this place. I'm going to perform signs, wonders, and miracles. I'm a man of God. That's been four or five years. He's still trying to get saved. Space cadet. Doesn't know if he's a foot or horseback. Running around tell, going to a thousand different churches. Trying to tell them they're not holy enough. They're not this. Let me tell you something. Don't you judge nothing until you produce it. Be careful how you judge the church. You are the church. Be careful what you say about the music if you're not in the choir. Be careful how you judge an usher. Why don't you be one? Be careful how you judge how the money's spent. Let, you, let yourself handle the responsibility. You'll find out overnight there's a lot more goes on to it than what meets the face or the eye. May we come to this with a humble heart. Jesus said in John 7 and 18, he said, He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. Christian television. You ever hear of a guy named Jesse? Jesse, 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 Jesse. Have you ever heard of a man named Jesus? Jesus, 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 Jesus. A man that speaks of himself. He said he's given himself the glory. But he that seeketh his glory that said him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. We're here to give God the glory. If he heals you tonight, somebody lays hands on you, and you get well, give God the glory. Give God the glory for everything that happens to you, created by God, called of God, privileged to serve such a God, 
privileged to know that a Christ of heaven would die for my sin and yours. What a privilege it is. Don't ever take any glory for whatever he says or does. Paul had to rebuke the Corinthian church. Why? Because they're arguing back and forth about who they belong to. We're of Paul because he planted the seed. So that makes us a little more important, a little more spiritual than the rest of you. You know... I went to Armenia and put up with hard living and all, so I'm more spiritual than you. No, I couldn't have got there unless you sent me. And I couldn't have done nothing when I got there if somebody didn't intercede. Paul said, you're running around. I'm a Paul. I belong to Paul. I'm more spiritual than you. I go to living waters. Does living waters go through you? But we're of Apollos, and he watered the seed. And without water, that seed cannot produce. So that makes our group a little better. In fact, we're probably even more spiritual than you because God used us to water it to make you look good. That's what they're saying. In church. Paul rebukes the Corinthian church because they're arguing back and forth. I'm of Paul. Well, I'm of Apollos. What'd Paul do? Plant his seed. Well, I'm of Apollos. We watered it. If it wasn't for us, there wouldn't be any produce. There wouldn't be any life. Nothing would have come out of it. Paul said, you're both a bunch of spiritual babies. Still drinking milk. You're not even mature enough to recognize you're both nothing. Oh, isn't that good? You guys get mad at me how I talk to you sometimes. How about Paul saying, you bunch of milk babies? He said, get off of your arguing back and forth. You're all nothing. You'd quit in a heartbeat if somebody told you that. But Pastor Paul said... It's not of Apollos. It's not of Paul that makes you an immature Christian. Does this mean then, church, that planting the seed is not important or not hard work? No, not at all. It's very hard work, especially in Paul's day. To prepare a field so that you could plant the seeds. Can you imagine what it took? No technology that we have today. Was the watering not important? Absolutely it was important. Not easy work. You couldn't water a crop then like you do one today. Think about it. I remember as a boy going to Arkansas every year on vacation. We'd stay three or four weeks. First thing my dad would do is go to all of our relatives because they all had gardens. And the first thing, I remember listening to him, nine, ten-year-old boy. How's your garden, he'd say. Well, Paul, let me tell you, if it doesn't rain soon, that garden's going to burn up. That's what they'd tell him. They were going to have a good mess. They called it a mess. A good mess of greens if it'll rain. But if we don't get some rain, we're not going to have a garden this year. I remember standing behind my dad, hearing them all tell the same story. I wasn't being a smart aleck. I'd stand behind my dad, and I thought, Dear God, Arkies, don't you know of a new thing called a water hose? I did. I thought, don't these guys know what a water hose could do? They're going to wait for it to rain. Because we don't know how to water it any other way. Let me tell you, long back at this time, there was nothing but rain. And if you got any water anywhere, you carried it a long ways. 
is the one planting the seed easy work not on your life to plow up that ground break up that fallow ground that's not easy that's hard labor that's hard work my dad told me that during the great depression they were so poor they never even had a mule an animal to plow their fields but he said his daddy my grandpa would strap on a plow and said he'd plow that garden heading down that old dirt road he said you talk about an animal said that old man would pull that plow plowing up that garden nothing easy about it he said his entire clothes was white as snow from the salt and the sweat hard work it's not easy to plant those seeds brother Roman can tell you many others can tell you Brother Daryl can tell you to go and to plant seed or to go and to investigate or to break ground in a tough, difficult country. It's not easy. It's very difficult. It's not easy to try to get water to a place of such a kind. It's not easy, saints of God. But God said it's not about the one that plowed the field, that planted the seed. He said it's not about the man or the woman that carried the water buckets but he said it's God that brings the increase I said God what does this mean he said it's my law of sowing and reaping that's why it's not that Paul said you're nothing in the sense your labor's in vain. Not what he's saying. Your labor is right. You've got to break the plow. You've got to break the ground. You've got to pour in the water. But only God of heaven supernaturally can take a seed and make it pop up out of that ground. Only God can bring a harvest. What am I telling? The gospel can be sown by the seed of preaching, watered with fasting and prayer and intercession, and only God can bring a harvest. Only God can bring that harvest. Wonderful to have men that will give their life to go plow and plant, but only God. Darren brought it out so beautifully this morning. How that in 1809 or 8, that the, the, the man, what was his name, that went to Judson, that went to Tibet and to the, the Thailand area, and he planted this gospel. He went six years, not one soul, nobody come to Christ, but he kept preaching. He went to prison. He kept praying. He kept doing what God told him to do. Not easy to plow that field. Not easy to plant that seed. But 200 years later ladies and gentlemen one of those seed is sitting on this third row right here. She is a product of that man of God that laid down his life. She came from that very area. Can you imagine what I'm saying? Only God can do that. We sent Brother Jacobson sponsoring him to tie and the Korean people. And God said, I got a better plan. Cost too much to just go, keep going back and forth and trying to get across seas. What a mess. What a, what, a, what a hassle. What a fight it is. So he said, I'm just going to bring all them refugees to America. He said, we won't have to fuss with it any longer. 75,000 of the Korean people, many of them said in the school of Christ, under Darren's teaching and preaching, they're now migrated to America. Starting churches from San Diego to Buffalo, New York in 40 some cities across this country 75,000 Korean people because one man planted the seed and years go by another waters another waters and none of us can take the credit of it none of us can take the glory why it takes a supernatural power of God it's a miracle that you can put a seed in the ground Watch it come up. It's an absolute miracle. Are you?
are you hearing me? Hallelujah. Paul said to them, planting the seed of this gospel is very important. Watering that seed is very important. But it still requires a miracle. Only God can do this. Because it's his law of sowing and reaping. And if it does not produce, then all that labor is in vain. Possibly, we've heard it said, that 85% possibly of the so-called church in America is not ready for the rapture. What does this mean, preacher? It means that all the religious works are in vain if 85% of the church doesn't budge during when the rapture takes place, that means only 15% has that word sunk deep into their heart, watered by prayer, watered by the preaching and the cry of the Spirit. And the Heavenly Father brings that fruit out of that ground, out of that dead life, and makes it alive. A child of God, washed in the blood of the Lamb, filled with the Spirit of God. It's very evident. Last year, people came by to visit us. They left this church 11, 12 years ago. I don't even remember exactly. So they came by and they came in this building. They're just looking around. They looked up here and something was said. And anyway, I said, we have a Pentecostal choir in this church. The lady said to me, Pentecostal choir? What's that mean? She said it with venom. What does that mean? I said, have you ever been with a Baptist one? If you have, you'll know the difference when you hear Pentecost. Call it arrogance, call it whatever you want. There's life. Watching Darren just get through preaching there in Armenia, that guy trying to interpret for him, you can tell the difference, can't you? It's like night and day. The whole difference. Why? It's a Holy Ghost. I said, it's the Holy Ghost. The word, the letter killeth. It's the spirit that makes it alive. What does that mean? The letter killeth. That just means you never experience what you're saying. It's just a bunch of words. You've never walked it out. You've never lived it out. You're nothing but a bunch of talk. And your letters killeth. But when the spirit comes, he makes that word alive. The word is quickening and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, the intents of the heart. What am I saying? Let the word of God that breathe those words one more time come through a Holy Ghost man. And that seed will come up again. And that seed will produce after its kind. Tonight I looked up on that platform. I said, that's Pentecost. There was a time in this church. Oh, do you talk about dead? We had a little group up here singing. Most beautiful voices you could ever ask for. Some belonged to quartets. Wonderful voices. Dead as dead could be. Why? Without the Holy Ghost, you're a letter that killeth. There has to be a life, a living thing. You say, I think you're just filled with a bunch of emotion. Then I can tell you, you're not filled with the Holy Ghost. Because when you get filled, you can't stay still. Was it our great preacher, Brother Clendenin, said, it's like a water hose that gets too much water in it, too much pressure in it. Try to hold it. That thing will flip, flop, jumping around. Why? It can't contain it. The water pressure gets too heavy. It gets to moving. That's why my wife looked down at me tonight. She said, you need to run. I said, I'm saving my energy. I might run a couple laps, but I couldn't preach for an hour. I said, I'm saving it. 
What am I telling you tonight? This Holy Ghost, you can't, you can't stay still. It'll drive you. He said it'll guide you into all truth. It will be a spirit of truth. It's the power of God. It'll transform you. It'll conform you. It'll make a man out of you. It'll make a child of God out of you. You can't live without the Holy Ghost. It's a seed of God. When it goes in, it'll bear much fruit. Oh, Jesus, let us see where we're at in this hour. Paul calls himself a wise master builder. See, it's not a light thing to be a wise builder. Ask the Haitians. It's a, a wise builder will look very close at the excavation. The first thing you see in a wise builder is not a beautiful building, but an ugly hole that has to be dug for the foundation. That foundation is everything you're going to build. Most of your tilt-ups you see in Southern California, the industrial buildings, they told us in tilting them up, they were built to stand an 8.0 earthquake. Why? Because of the foundation, the way they built it, the way those walls went down. They're supposed to be able to take a shake, a sway, a seven leveled Haiti. It wiped out probably over 100,000 people. Why? Because there was no foundation. Paul said, a wise builder builds on a foundation. Death for a child of God always must come first. Then the life comes. Jesus said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. Fighting for our next breath. But if we'll let that corn of wheat, like Christ, go into the ground and die, it no longer abides alone. He said, if it die, it brings forth, bears forth much fruit. It's out of our death comes a life of a living Christ. Church, this is what that foundation must be. We go down before we go up. Never be afraid of a thorough work and a deep conviction. Church, why? Because this is what the foundation is all about. I've been saying it in our church. I'm going to say it in this camp meeting. In this final hour, saints of God, there's going to be a greater conviction than possibly we've witnessed maybe in the last 30 to 40 years. There's going to be a greater conviction. Number one, because the coming of the Lord is at the door. And number two, no man can come to the Father except the spirit of the father draw him that conviction is not to drive you out that conviction is to pull you to Calvary without the conviction you only come to repeat the same sins like my grandma told my dad she got baptized she said I went down a dry center come up a wet one Amen. You'll get it in a minute. It's not so much, church, a mere emotion, see, as it is a thorough work being done in a heart set for God and righteousness. See, it never bothered me when I learned what I'm telling you, that the Holy Ghost would convict when a Daryl Turner or anyone else, McGee, whoever, Brother Casey, whoever preaches, if there's a conviction grips my heart, I don't mind at all. I don't need to pray for nobody. I'm spinning around in that chair, and I'm going to deal with what the Holy Ghost is dealing with. He loves me. He's not mad at me. He's trying to convict me. He's preparing me to walk. Walk on streets of glory. He's coming for a glorious church. A bride without a spot, without a wrinkle. Don't tell, tell yourself you're going to go play in church. No, no. There's a deep conviction. 
And it has to come. And it's going to come in a greater measure than ever before. And I don't care if you've been saved a month, a week, or 50 years. When that conviction grips your heart, you run to Calvary. Whether it's at your chair or at this altar. Altars fill up most of the time here. But don't be afraid, child of God. Spin around in that chair. Let him deal with you. Let him deal with this preacher. We've none of us arrived. We're our exactly what Paul said. I'm nothing, Kirk. I can plant till my knees wear out. I can plant till I can't move another muscle. I'm nothing. You can water and water and water and water. That makes you nothing but a child of God in the vineyard of God. And if God doesn't bring the increase, it's over and in vain. Let him deal. I did not understand totally. This camp meeting was going to go the way that it went. Exactly the way that it's gone. As it went last night, God said to me, I'm getting my bride ready for the rapture of the church. He said, don't you try to box me in. Don't you try to have a camp meeting like you had for 16, 17 years. I worked. I dealt a certain way. You follow this cloud. Where that cloud is, there'll be manna. Where that cloud is, the spirit and the power of God will be there. Be sensitive to that Holy Ghost. Because why? Tomorrow it may be the end. Tomorrow may be a nuclear holocaust. Tomorrow may be a terrorist attack that wipes out half of America. I want to be right. I want to be ready. I want to live right, guided by a conviction. It makes my heart say, oh God, don't let me say or do anything without a conviction coming immediately. So I can say right, do right, get it right. See, the foundation must be Jesus Christ and the, his atoning blood, his perfect righteousness, and his finished work built on faith and hope. A conversion that is founded on mere emotional excitement will be followed by backslidings as numerous and quick from Sunday to Thursday night. People that came to this altar to repent have repeated the same sins. Why? It's an emotional thing. I see them crying, so I'm crying. I feel that people are being pulled, so I'm going to go. It's got to run deeper than that child of God. There's got to be a foundation in that life. The foundation of the Lord standeth sure. And it hath this seal on it that God knoweth them that are his. There's got to be a foundation under the child of God. The Bible said it so plain, so clear. Flesh and blood cannot reveal this to you, Peter. But the Spirit of God revealed it. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said it's our that rock that I am the Christ the son of the living God that I'm going to build my church you and I are his church built on what Catholic church says they're, they're built on Peter a piece of that rock and that that charge was to Peter because of what Jesus said I got a second question Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, Pete. The Spirit of God in heaven revealed that to you. Ten minutes later, he said, get behind me, Satan. Which one of those did they use to build the church of Peter on? Amen. Get behind me, Satan, or Jesus, thou art the rock, the Christ, the Son of the living God is my foundation. What part of Peter's confession did they build that? church on what am I telling you tonight only a Holy Ghost Pentecostal experience filled with the power of God knows what a foundation is it'll stand in Cuba it'll stand in Russia it'll stand on this planet anywhere you go the power of God is heaven 
and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. All power is given unto me, Jesus said, in heaven and in earth. Stand